Welcome everyone, uh, folks who are joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. We still have some people uh, coming in through the waiting room. We'll give folks just one more minute and we'll go ahead and get started with our information session on Grad Research Live. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to our information session on Grad Research Live. My name is Dr. Ashley Sorrell, and I am the Assistant Director of Graduate Student Professional Enhancement in the Graduate School. And I'm here with my two colleagues and I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, Morris, we'll start with you. Hi everyone, welcome to this session. I'm Morris Grubbs, Assistant Dean in the Graduate School and I've been working with the 3MT here at UK for, it's probably been almost 10 years. Um, it's been a long, illustrious history, and uh, I'm glad you're part of it today. And I hope you do participate. hope you decide to participate. I'll turn it to Chad. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Gilpin. I'm the Program Manager for Graduate Student Professional Enhancement, and uh, I'm excited to hear your uh, 3MT presentations. Not today, not today, but I'm excited <laughs> forward to the 3MT. Surprise, this is the competition, no. <laughs> um, and I also wanna mention um, Amanda Sloan. She is our graduate assistant in the graduate school and she'll also be serving on a panel that we'll host a little bit later in this session. So for this session, what we're gonna do is provide an overview of the competition, um, some framing in which to think about the competition and in your research and presentation. And then we'll end with a panel of three previous winners from the 3MT or early research track uh, competitions. So first, I just want to uh, give a little overview of Grad Research Live. Um, this is a research showcase that challenges you to present your research in three minutes or less, but also in a way that engages a non-specialist audience or a general audience. We think of this as a way and what an entryway into public scholarship and also um, as a way in which you can think about the relevance of your research beyond the walls of academia. Your participation in this research does, um, or I'm sorry, your participation in this competition um, will include, or you could be eligible for prizes for that we'll get into a little bit later, monetary prizes. So we are supported by a collaboration between the Graduate School, the Graduate Student Congress, and the Society of Postdoctoral Scholars. And let me pause here to say that if you have any questions uh, during the course of our presentation, please feel free to go ahead and chat those. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. So we um, kind of revised the 3MT here at UK a couple of years ago. While the 3MT is the official competition that comes out of um, Queensland in Australia, we noticed that there was interest among graduate students who wanted to still present their research in this public way, but maybe who did not have results yet um, or were quite there at the 3MT stage in order to do so. So um, a few years back, we created three tracks um, 
for in which students can participate. The first is the pre 3 MT or this is early in your research. So if you are at the proposal stage of your dissertation um, or just getting into your research of your dissertation, this might be the track um, that you consider taking part in. The second is the official 3 MT. So the official 3MT, if you have data, results, arguments, um, a thesis supported by evidence, uh, this would be the track that you would consider. Now, you can enter into the early research track and then the following year do the 3MT track. Um, these, thing, uh, these different tracks are meant to kind of flow into each other. Or if you are unsure about which track you might fit into, um, you know, either Morris and I are happy to talk to you about that and offer suggestions of where we might see your presentation best fit fitting. And we also have a postdoc track for postdoctoral uh, scholars on campus who want to present their research, uh, practice presenting their research in a public scholarship type of framework. So those are our three tracks. Um, and in the process, we will have preliminaries. And then from the preliminaries, we will choose between, you know, five to eight participants in each track that go on to the finals. Um, so the preliminaries will be video submissions and the due date for those are October 26th. I am going to paste a planning document, a link to a planning document in the chat for you all. And in that planning document, it kind of helps you get started by also but also providing um, the rules, overviews, and a link to how to where you can submit your video submission. You can also find this link on the grad school's webpage um, in the grad research live page as well. And we can provide a link for that here in just a little bit. So this year, in the past years, we have held the finals um, in Warsham Cinema, but we've decided to modernize and see what it would be like to hold the final in the UK FCU Esports Theater. And this is in the new Cornerstone Building on Limestone. So finals, if you've been notified as a finalist, will be Thursday, November 10th at 5 p.m., where you will give your 3MT or your research presentation in person uh, to an audience of, um, you know, from across the disciplines, from the community. And we typically um, get our judges. There'll be mm, three judges that are typically come from the community. So in past years, we've had um, a judge from a television news station, uh, Barbara Bailey, a news anchor from WKYT. Um, we've also had judges uh, who represent the Lexington Herald Leader, the newspaper, um, and also some public nonprofit, educational nonprofits, and um, the state legislature. So the judges vary from different um, corners of the community. So audiences of paramount importance for this. I uh, can't overemphasize the importance of keeping audience at the, at the forefront of your mind as you're creating your script for, for your talk. Um, I mean, it's, it's best, as Ashley said at the beginning of this, to imagine a general public audience. You, I, I mean, you can also imagine somewhere between you know, I think it's helpful to imagine somewhere between a high school graduate and a, and a college audience or an undergraduate audience for this. Um, but it's, you have to be hypersensitive to audience and tailor your talk to your audience. When I say hypersensitive, I don't mean that it should freak you out that you're speaking in front of an audience. I just mean that everything you say and the way you say it, the choices you make about your talk, need to bear in mind this general audience. And that's something that in graduate school, we're just not very, very used to. And we don't get a lot of practice at this because you're used to speaking with peers mostly 
uh, and, and experts in your field. So this is a very different exercise. So part of what you're doing in this <clears throat> paying attention to audience is also giving them signals so they can know when to pay attention most, what to take away, and so they can follow your talk in a logical fashion from beginning to end. That last point on the slide is not meant to freak you out either. Don't, you don't have to imagine that you're going to be giving your talk in, in Rupp Arena or Kroger Stadium, but that, that's just to point out that sort of audience you know, is what you need to have in mind. You can also imagine a single individual. That might be helpful when you're actually crafting the script. Someone who is not a specialist, uh, who's, who maybe hasn't gone to graduate school, but has a college degree, let's say, um, and, and imagine that you're talking to that person. Next slide. So it's important for this exercise to tell a story, and that's again something you don't do a lot of in graduate school, unless you're in the humanities or in creative writing in particular. But this has an, a couple of important implications to it. One, telling a story, if, if, you, if you know the story, if you've crafted the story, it's easy to remember for you as the teller. So you don't have to rely on note cards or you don't have to uh, stress about remembering all the details. If you can remember the basic arc of the story from beginning to end, you, you have that to rely on. It's also, the second point here is in, in this, after the semicolon, is that it, it makes it easy for your audience to follow what you're saying as well and what you want to get across about your research. So, so it works both for you and for the audience. In telling the story and in crafting the script, it's best to leave out the details of your research process. It's, you're so entrenched in graduate school in the process itself that it's hard to let that go uh, sometimes. But for this, you do have to let it go and just focus instead on the, the meaning of the results that you're getting, or if you're in the early track, what you uh, suspect you may find, uh, or, or what the purpose is of your research, uh, you know, wh why is it so useful, what, what are its implications, and so forth. That's what really matters in the 3MT, not the details of the process itself. Next slide. So in telling a good story, uh, you'll have a, a beginning, middle, and end. And so part of this is finding those core ideas and then using the scaffold of the story, uh, sort of the story structure to, to, to convey that, uh, to convey those ideas. You're going to engage your listener in the story by, by capturing their attention and then gradually introducing complexity. If you've had much experience writing a newspaper article, this is sort of what the structure is for that. The important points are up front at the beginning, and then gradually uh, more details are given, or it, it, the, the, in this instance, uh, the, the complexity is revealed of your research gradually through the story. Um, and then, it's important in stories that you have concreteness, that you're not just describing in general ways, but that you're actually using examples and anecdotes, analogies and so forth to engage as many of the senses as you can so that it's easy for your audience to see what you're talking about. You can use your graphic in your slide to help you with this. But just the way the word choices that you use and the way you tell the story should also help engage the audience's imagination so they can, depending on your topic, they can also perhaps hear some of what you're describing in some ways. They can feel it uh, and, and so forth. And then in building that story, you're also 
relying on some of the elements of traditional storytelling, uh, if you can, by making points in your story exciting, uh, unsettling maybe sometimes. You're recounting some of the difficulties and obstacles maybe that you encountered in your path uh, and some of the successes and the triumphs and maybe there's still quite a bit of mystery left in your topic that you're trying to to solve and so all of that can make the story interesting next slide in graduate school you're you're probably having to leave out a lot of your emotion in your writing again unless you're in the humanities perhaps but for this, go ahead and show your emotions, show your passion. That'll come through in the telling of your story and your stage presence and can help engage the audience for sure. So feel free to do that. Um, and that, that might, for, for some of us, take, take a little practice actually to, to be a little bit vulnerable on stage. I think can go a long way. And that's something that we do not do very much of in academia. But for this, for a general audience, it'll go a long way. Next slide. So just to, again, we can't emphasize the audience enough. So we've got a couple of slides on this. But in the beginning, in the first few sentences, try to catch the attention of the audience. That might be giving an anecdote of some sort, some sort of uh, personal um, experience that you've had that relates to your research or someone that you know, something that engages the human story. Uh, you can use some strategies of withholding and foreshadowing. Um, I mean, you can hint at things that maybe you're going to get to later in your story. Uh, to, to make them hang on and want to listen to the rest of your story. So you can, with, you can hint and then withhold. You can do a little bit of foreshadowing, suggesting that you're going in this direction and you're going to tell them more about this. Uh, so, so again, they'll want to, to stick around and listen closely. One way to catch attention in the early part of your story is to establish some common ground. Uh, between between the the topic that you're going to be describing and the lives of your audience, so wh where where do those two meet? What's the intersection? What are I mean? There's multiple intersections probably, but what what one intersection do you want to zoom in on and convey? And ultimately, they they should be asking themselves. Your audience should ask themselves, why should I care about what this um, this project is, what does it matter to me, and what do I need to remember, what do I, what do I want to take away from this. So anticipate these kinds of questions as you're crafting your script. Next slide. Turn it over to you, Ashley. So one aspect that uh, can be sort of overlooked, but that is of critical importance to the Grad Research Live competition is creating a title that is maybe provocative or engaging. Um, I know I definitely have difficulty doing this. I always want to go to the colon, um, but we um, you know, want to de-emphasize kind of our academic framework or minds um, around thinking about our research in that title. So it has to be short. Um, I think, um, you know, somebody once told me, if you could describe your dissertation in a bumper sticker and have it fit on a bumper sticker, what would it be? Or a title of your dissertation. And so think of that bumper sticker kind of um, idea when looking at your title. It can be fun, uh, depending on your topic. Your topic might be really serious and fun isn't, um, isn't necessarily the best approach, but you know, if your topic does have some elements um, that are joyful, that can be fun, you know, you can keep your title fun um, in that way. 
Here, I mentioned bumper sticker, but I like the idea of a newspaper headline um, and not an academic journal title. So, you know, not, you know, something that's, you know, shorter colon and then the longer description of what it is, you know, just condense it. Newspaper headline that catches people's attention, um, make them want to grab that newspaper or make them want to hear uh, your talk. So here is an example um, of how one participant from the University of Queensland kind of revised their title. So we see their dissertation title was Structures and Features and Complex Visual Stimuli Assisting Identification and Forensics. That title, you know, from for me outside of um, his field, I really don't know what the talk will be able what the talk will be about um, or, you know, any type of context. But he was able to change and condense suspect science in CSI. Now, I know CSI, I used to watch CSI way back in the day. And so I have and can grab that frame of relevance to give me an idea of maybe what this talk might be about or to at least pique my curiosity to want to attend the talk and see uh, what this particular participant has to say. Next slide, Chad. So along with the title, another important aspect is an appealing slide uh, that is visually appealing. We don't want a slide with a lot of text, words. We don't want your maybe your poster then just put on a slide. Um, we want a slide that really emphasizes the visuals, because the focus, you have to think again back to your audience. Your audience are non-specialists. They're not in your field. They may not um, you know, even be at UK. They might be members of the community. And so how can you appeal and engage that audience through visualization, through imagery, and you know, very little text? Uh, next slide, Chuck. So here's an example uh, from past winners of 3MTs. So we hear, here we have someone who was presenting um, their science research, and you can see that they use really visually appealing slides that, you know, on one side that are diametrically opposed. You can kind of um, look at this slide and get a vague sense of what they're talking about. But if you picture the person in front of the slide giving their talk, you can see how the slide might help the audience visually grasp um, the core concept of their talk. And Chad, if you have anything to add with the slides, please do so. Uh, next slide. There it goes, sorry about that. That's okay. And uh, just another example, um, this is Anna Betzel's slide, and she will be on our panel later. She was a winner of the 3MT in 2019. And Anna Betzel from the Department of English, you can see how she's connecting her English discipline and research to an event that at that time was a current event happening. And we can see the way in which she's using English visualization with a rather um, compelling image and photo from um, the Supreme Court hearings of Brett Kavanaugh. Um, she can, she'll talk about um, her topic in the panel, um, but we can see this is a very uh, visually gripping slide. And also look at their titles. The titles on here are their 3MT titles. Um, here we can see a creative use of text that's visually appealing, not just kind of your standard Times New Roman text, um, and also connecting that to their research with a rather, you know, simple image, but an image that is creative and the jelly beans being uh, positioned like the brain, and then we know that this talk is about dementia. So this is just some examples of visually appealing slides uh, for you all to um, kind of consider when thinking about your slide or the creation of your slide uh, for your talk. Um, we really, you know, just encourage visualization um, and images and not be so text-based or text-heavy. 
Uh, we are going to send out a copy of these slides and post them on the website that I linked above for those who have asked. Okay, next slide. All right, now we are going to move on to our panel of past winners. Um, this is an opportunity for you to engage with past winners to ask any questions you might have of the process. I, of course, have uh, questions ready to go as well, and I will get us started with my questions. But if something comes to mind as we're having this conversation, please feel free to go ahead and chat your question, and I'm happy to interrupt myself and ask yours instead of mine. So uh, just as brief introductions, we have on our panel Dr. Anna Betzel. She is a PhD from the Department of English, and she was our first place winner of the 2019 3MT competition. Dr. Carly Fedorka, she is a PhD from the Department of Veterinary Science, and she was the first place winner of our 2016 3MT competition. And Amanda Sloan, who is the P a PhD candidate in the College of Communication and Information Science. And she was actually our first place winner in 2021. So just last year of our Grad Research Live Early Research Track competition. So she can uh, talk more about the early research uh, track side of this initiative. So Chad, you can go ahead and stop sharing the screen uh, so we can all see each other. And I'm gonna start uh, with a question for the panelists that really is just go ahead and introduce yourself so we can start putting your face with your name, um, your current position as far as career or at UK, and your top and the topic of your 3MT. So Carly, we'll go ahead and start with you. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Carly Fedorka. Um, I obviously won it in 2016, so quite some time ago, which seems a little bit crazy to me, but I actually just finished up uh, a postdoc also at UK and am currently employed as a scientist. Sorry, that's my dog barking. I'm, I also, um, outside of being a scientist at UK, I also have my own horse farm. So I am actually at my horse farm right now, juggling this presentation in between riding some horses. Um, but the topic of my talk was on cleaning up dirty mares. So how we actually treat infections of the uterus in mares that we're trying to get pregnant on these thoroughbred farms here in town. So that was my synopsis. And I probably did a better job six years ago than I could do it now. Anna? Hey, my name is Anna Betzel, and um, I graduated in 2019 from UK with a PhD in English. I actually left academia um, and have been working in software since September 2019. So um, decided kind of midway through my grad career that I wanted to finish but pursue something else. So that's my dog. Um, I don't have a horse farm now. Um, and I'm currently employed as a senior analyst in the education and enable department at Medallia. Great, thanks. Amanda? Hi, my name is Amanda Sloan. I'm in the uh, Clark graduate study, so I'm trying not to disturb some of the other people studying here, but I am currently a PhD candidate in the College of Communication and Information. I work part-time in the graduate school as a communications coordinator, and I also teach in transformative learning for their UK 125 courses, and I did my presentation also on my dissertation topic. At the time, I had only finished my proposal, so it was only up to that part, and mine was on combating misinformation using um, an inoculation theory, which is a popular theory in my discipline. Great. Thank you all. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us and talk about to talk about your 3MT experience and the process. I my first question, um, you know, because the participants in the room might be on the fence on whether or not um, they want to go through with the submission and then the competition. So I'm wondering from you, what motivated you to take part in the competition? What was the motivation? And anyone can answer or start. 
I guess I can go. Um, I'll be brutally honest. It was the money. Uh, as we all know, graduate student stipends are not a lot. And I like communicating. I like talking about my research. And I thought I could do a pretty good job of it. So the, the monetary incentive definitely appealed to me. And then by winning the competition, I actually got to represent UK on the national level and got a paid for trip to Annapolis, Maryland for a few days. So even more incentive. And, and you know, I didn't think of it at the time, but in hindsight, I actually have my recorded three minute thesis from the competition on my CV. And I think that it's really helpful when I'm applying for teaching positions or even positions in academia or in industry, because being able to communicate veterinary science research to the masses, it's easy to say you can and to have just that three minute clip on my CV that they can click on that's on YouTube, I think it's been really helpful. You're breaking up a little bit, but I think we got um, most of what you said about the your motivation and kind of the added benefit of being able to link um, your your presentation on your CV and use that in potential job opportunities. Um, Anna, what motivated you? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about what I found were the benefits afterwards, but what motivated me was in addition to the money, which like Carly was also a huge motivating factor, um, really just two other things. Uh, one, I think Norris and Ashley, y'all actually asked me to do it. And I would do like literally anything for you. If you were like, go jump off the cliff, I would be like, I mean, okay. Um, <laughs> so that was one reason. Um, and then I also had seen, um, I, I'd run the competition the year before and I'd seen an English PhD candidate come so, so close to winning it. And so I was just like, I need to do this for the sake of the humanities, it's a martyr for my discipline. I just really wanted to see whether um, the humanities could win because I didn't see any reason that we couldn't. Great, thank you. So Morris and I are also asking all of you to take part. I don't know if we have as much pool. <laughs> um, and Amanda, was it the money um, first with you as well? It wasn't the money first, but that definitely was a bonus. I was also on the fence on whether or not I wanted to participate, but I think it eventually at a point, I just figured why not try it? Um, it definitely helped in communicating the, my research to people who are in a late audience. So my friends and extended family would ask all the time, what are you doing for your dissertation? And it would always take me forever to try to explain to them what I was doing. And so this kind of finally kind of really gave me an incentive to say, okay, can I get it down to three minutes or less? So that when people inevitably keep on asking me, I don't understand what you're doing, what are you doing? Then I can actually explain to them in a manageable time frame. Yeah, good. So that is kind of the the difficult, intimidating part, right? So how did you, what was your process starting out and condensing or finding something um, within your research that you were going to present in three minutes or less in a compelling way? Was there a particular process you went through? You know, how did you even start, Amanda? Sure. So I started with way too much to say. <laughs> My dissertation project is a little complicated. And so I had to narrow down the kind of contextual topic is I'm studying first year graduate students. But in thinking about it, a lay audience is not really going to care about what happens to graduate students unless you are in graduate school or in the academic realm. So I started thinking about other aspects of my dissertation that I could talk about and the inoculation theory piece and how that can help combat misinformation. That was really something that I felt could connect with a broader audience. And so I picked out that one piece of my dissertation. I started just jotting down a bunch of ideas on a document. And eventually I tried to narrow it down to, you know, what is it that I'm explaining to people? 
why should they care? And what do I hope to get out of the study? So since I didn't have data yet, if once I did collect data, what is it that I hope to find? And so if I could get it down to those three main points in three minutes, I figured that was more than enough to cover. So that was kind of how I started with my content. Great. Right. And Anna, you mentioned, um, you know, the humanities and historically humanities not being all that well represented in the uh, 3MT competition. And I just asked if there are any humanities folks in the room. It doesn't look like it, um, but we're hoping to get more humanities involved. So what was the process for you? Was there um, added difficulty coming from the humanities and English literature? You know, how did you kind of work through uh, creating a presentation um, that would engage audiences and show relevance? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think like on a high level with like the relevance part, um, I actually kind of start with the assumption, like I think in my opening sentence, like what do these dusty old books like have to do with real life? Because honestly, with my dissertation topic, which is the Anglo-Irish Gothic heroine, not even most English scholars want to read the text that I was looking at. So, and I love them, I think they're important. So I was like, okay, well, what is it about them that is important? Um, and I then to get there, just basically put myself through the same exercises that I did with my WRD 101 and 110 or 110 and 112 students, um, which a lot of times when they were starting a big research project, I would just have them start with an idea where they first write down everything that they're thinking about and then they condense it into six words. And then they just kind of repeat that process. And I think that's helpful no matter what um, discipline and topic that you're working across. And so there were a couple of iterations of that and playing with different ideas. Um, it, uh, I was thinking about Dr. Blasius Ford testimonials a lot. They were already on my mind. Um, and I just saw that as a natural connection and the only thing that I would emphasize really for anybody thinking about doing this now is it kind of seems like, I remember when I was in your shoes, it seems like there's only one 3MT that my dissertation possibly could have produced. And that's not true. There's so many different angles. I chose one text from my dissertation. Um, like if I was doing it now, it would probably be something like, you know, uh, understanding like Southern white feminism through the lens of Anglo-Irish heroines, something like that. Um, so there are so many different directions that you can go in and different ways that you can make it relevant. There's not just one single approach, I think. So just play around. And Carly, I saw you uh, nodding in agreement about um, there being many different directions. Uh, you can take your 3MT. How did you uh, come to the direction you took um, and craft kind of your, your presentation? Yeah, so I was nodding along because I was thinking about how, I think I could still give that presentation, by the way, like it's so memorized in my brain and it's been six years, which is horrifying. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about how that script came to be. And I actually participated in my department's three minute thesis first. And so I, you know, I had a, a very easier audience. I didn't have to explain to that audience why breeding horses was cool. Um, and I didn't have to explain to them why being interested in horses was cool. And then when I did the, the university wide three minute thesis, I had a very different audience, you know, just even in doing a three minute thesis, it was a very different type of um, presentation to give. And so when I did it at UK, I had to convince the audience that horses were cool or that breeding horses was cool, but it's Kentucky. So it wasn't that hard to convince them that breeding horses was important. And then when I went to the national level, well, then it was a whole different ball game because convincing a bunch of people in Annapolis, Maryland, that breeding horses is important is very different. So even throughout the process of it, as it went from one level to the next, the, the, the thesis changed. 
And so I think, you know, as I practiced it for the departmental one, I got it very clear, very concise. I had a really good idea of what I wanted to say. And then when I went to the university level, it, the script completely changed. And so realizing that if you can do that just within one university, <laughs> that you have so many different ways to tell that story. And, and it goes, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but it goes as detailed as like what picture you choose for your slide, the title you choose, like that changed every single time I gave that talk. So you don't have to get, don't get so stuck in this hole in your mind right now as you're getting nervous to prepare it. Like you're going to be changing that slide the day of. <laughs> so just be ready to roll with the punches. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the slides and creating the slide. Um, how did you, kind of a similar question, how did you approach the task? And Carly, we can go ahead and start with you of creating an engaging but minimalistic slide, you know, having one space in which to, you know, put up kind of the theme of your talk, but not being able to use a lot of words. Yeah, so I actually, by the time I got to the national level, I had no words on my slide. I, y'all are a lot luckier than I was because there was no real basis for what this was when I did it six or seven years ago. So I YouTubed a ton of videos out of Australia and I kind of realized which type of talk I gravitated to. And there, I don't know if I could find it still, but there was a really cool one with a girl that had purple hair and she was talking about like neuroscience and she was mesmerizing, but the slide was just a picture of a brain. Mm -hmm. And I was like, she constantly brings it up and refers back to this picture of the brain but there was nothing on the slide besides that picture. So that was kind of the strategy I did is I used a picture of a mare and foal and it just, oh, there it is. And it just happened to be a mare that I bred and that foal ended up going on to win the Kentucky Derby. So I went back and back to this is why this is important. It's not so much that I want to just impregnate mares, but it has a massive impact on what we do as a civilization on that first Saturday in May. So this, it's funny to bring up this because this is what was the university one. And by the time I went to the national level, level, there was no text and it was a different picture. So that's kind of what I'm saying is like, it's, it's going to constantly change. And uh, if I could do it in hindsight, I would even like change the orientation of that picture. <laughs> so <laughs> keeping that in mind, you'll get more and more particular as you get older. Yeah, <laughs> well, great. Um, Anna, your slide we use as an example in our in our opening presentation is very visually striking. Um, what was your thought process behind the creation of that? I think I wanted the slide to embody kind of the, the premise I was starting out with. That's something that seems old, antique, impenetrable, like the, the antithesis of modern. Um, actually, like there's a very direct line from it to where we are now with women testifying for the country um, about evil, powerful men. And so that's basically why I chose like that really like old like book template that like, I don't think that anybody like would see that and like want to like actually pick it up looking at it. They'd probably be like old boring book I've never heard of, even English majors. And then that directly contrasted with like that really powerful picture of Dr. Blasey Ford, I just thought did a good job of kind of indicating like there's a connection here and it's interesting. What does this, what, what does one have to do with the other? Because they don't seem to like, yeah. I'm going to explain how. Great. And Amanda, can I ask, I think, can I ask yeah, a question yeah, to Anna? Sure. Did you intentionally choose a polarizing picture? as your title like were you did you do it on purpose and or were you concerned that it would impact your scoring um yes yes and yes um <laughs> basically uh i i got to the point where i realized um with my dissertation and with the point that i was making that 
I believed in it really, really strongly. I thought the evidence pointed that way, but it was also, it was important to me. So like kind of back to your point, Morris, about making it passionate, about making it personal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, probably for most of us too, we're teaching and our research is intricately tied to our teaching. And I knew my students were gonna come see me and I thought, no, if I'm gonna, they they know how I feel about them, how I care about them. and. Um, I'm, I'm going with this because this is what I think and be that as it may, I really do think this message needs to go out there. And, um, yes, I, I didn't think I would win. <laughs> I think more I, I think that's a good point on my face like, when it was announced. And I think I was like stuffing cheese and crackers because yeah. I was like, well, I'm not going to win. But um, I think it's a good point because it shows yeah. that you do better if you just toss it all out there and make it personal yeah. and make it emotional. Cause that's mine was as well. Anyhow, that was my only point. Cause when I saw yeah. it, when I saw the example of your slide, I was like, oh, I would have been in the room going, whoo, okay, let's roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such a good question, Carly. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. Just put everything you have on the line. Cause this is your, it's your project and it's your three minutes. Yep. Yeah, great takeaway. Amanda, with your slide, thinking about your dissertation or yeah, your dissertation topic and the topic of your talk, it, I would imagine it was difficult to think about how you would visualize that in a slide. Can you talk about um, what the choices you made and why you made those? Sure. So yes, it was definitely difficult to figure out how to convey this very complex theory in a very simple but visually appealing way for a lay audience. Um, I The slide that I ended up using in my final presentation was definitely not what I submitted initially to the preliminary round. And I got a lot of feedback from the first round that I had included too much text naturally as an academic and a communication scholar in the slide. And so I needed to figure out a way to turn all of that text and information into pictures. And so I actually, I reached out to one of my cousin's fiancés um, who had a bit of graphic design experience. And I was kind of talking to him and I was like, okay, if you could just put this in a picture form, like how could, how can you explain this? Cause I felt I was really kind of in the weeds of it and was having a hard time seeing the forest through the trees. And so I really was just like, okay, if you could explain this in a picture, what would you pick? And he kind of helped me with the one, two, three aspect. He was like, it sounds like you're just describing three phases of things. And so that really helped me pick out, okay, let me try to explain this theory in three steps. And I wanted the slide itself to stand alone. Um, since I couldn't spend the entire time talking about the theory, I wanted it to be pretty clear from the slide um, what the theory was trying to do so that I was really just supplementing the slide with what I said. And so that I could focus on other aspects, like why is it important and what do I hope to find out of this? So I didn't spend the entire time just talking about a theory. Great, thank you so much. And in the conversation between um, Carly and Anna about, you know, being personal, kind of putting yourself out there uh, during your presentation, it leads me to wonder, um, how did you prepare for the in-person presentation? You know, what, is there anything you wish you would have done differently? And Anna, we can start with you. I just practice it all the time like going around the house. I practiced it. I practiced it to my dog. My partner at the time could basically recite it with me by the time I competed. Um, so just recite it. Like as you go about your daily business, I think that actually helped because I was just comfortable. I was walking around. I was cleaning the bathroom. I was washing dishes. I was making up the bed and I was saying this speech. And that helps you really get comfortable in your body while you're saying it. Carly or Amanda? Yeah, I did the exact same thing. I had a 30 minute drive to Gluck every day and I practiced it in the car constantly. Um, I will add the feedback that I got yelled at by judges <laughs> when I wanted at UK for moving too much. Um, and if you do find the YouTube video of me giving the talk, I do move a lot. Um, so little stuff like that, you know, being able to practice the the speech is important to know what you're going to say but a try to also rehearse hand gestures 
how you stand, how you present yourself. And then even more so, like Morris said earlier, finding ways to um, look at and entice specific audience members and really be animated with those gestures, with the face. Um, I think that was just as important as what I was saying. You could have given the exact same talk memorized, but if you have no intonation or you give it in a very dry tone, you're not gonna do well. So being able to speak creatively as much as giving a good presentation is I think super important. Totally agree. Go drama class all the way. Like you'll feel like you're overacting and you're not. <laughs> the way I thought of it, I had a pretty tough um, advisor for my PhD who, did not have a sense of humor, nor did he read sarcasm. So I, I, I basically told myself like, these are your three minutes. You have been filtered and suppressed for five years. So everything you wish you could have said excited in his office, let it out now. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I recited it a bunch of different times to my pets, to my fiance. Again, he could probably recite it as well. And so I think that practice um, is very good. The only thing I think I wish I would have done is I recited to individuals or small groups that presenting in front of a larger audience is a little bit different. So if you can get a group of friends or have just a bunch of family members show up on Zoom for you so you can walk through it and just get that experience of more than one face staring at you, I think that is really good practice as well. But yeah, practice makes perfect, essentially. Just keep repeating it to yourself. Thank you all. So being on the other side of the competition as winners um, and for Anna and Carly, um, winners from, you know, a couple years past, are there ways in which your experience with the 3MT Grad Research Live has stayed with you? Um, what kind of what, what did you ultimately take away from your participation in the competition? And I'll let anyone start. Um, I, like I said earlier, I, I think it was a very good experience, like you all pointed out earlier, um, to solidify skill sets that I thought I had, um, but really hadn't practiced. I, I was laughing when I saw who else was on the panel because you guys are saying the humanities are underrepresented, but I see that it's an English major and somebody that's in communications that are winning. And I'm like, well, duh, like they, they communicate for the PhD. Um, I was very nervous to try to convince a group that horses were cool. Um, but I also realized, like we said earlier, that I am going to have to do that until the day I die if this is the, the career I want to go into. And I've been doing it for the past 10 years as well. So like we said earlier, being able to refine that skill of explaining to people what you do for a living when you do something very strange is useful, it's important. And I do think that if you get good at it, it will help you land jobs leaving academia or leaving your um, doctorate, which we know that jobs in academia are a bit tricky to get these days. So. I think just being able to meet somebody at a conference and say, oh, this is what I studied during my PhD and entertain them for a few minutes will pay off in the future. So I definitely think back on that elevator talk every time I meet somebody that I would like to collaborate with or work with. Great, thank you. Anna or Amanda, things you took away? Yeah, I'll definitely second Carly. And in fact, I think Carly, it was hearing you talk about putting the link to the video like on your CV before mm -hmm. I even did it. That I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. That's a reason I should do it. And sure enough, I've gotten like job interviews before and offers because people have gone through my resume and been like, well, you didn't actually have a lot of industry experience, but wow, like you are a professional and you can deliver a complex topic in an engaging way. Um, so just you really are, have this uh, like opportunity to demonstrate both like the complexity of your thought and also your professionalism um, in the 3MT, which even if you don't end up placing, you're going to have that video and you can still put that on your CV. And to me now that is 
more valuable than the money. Like the money is gone and spent, it's done with that remains. And then the only other thing I'll add is that um, I do think for me, it also really accelerated like the pace at which my dissertation came together because having to think um, like you have to do a lot of actually higher order level thinking. You have to take all the articles you've been working with, all the data, all the text, and to synthesize that, um, that's going to make you think very pointedly about like what this chapter is saying. And I ended up even kind of doing not the whole spiel, but the same kind of six word condensed and expand exercises with the rest of my chapters is this one. Um, because it's so helpful. So it will also benefit your research, both in clarity and in um, really bringing together the scope. Amanda? You're still in the process, process, so I'm wondering if it's changed Yes, I'm process. still experiencing it, but I yeah. agree with both <laughs> what Carly and Anna have said, especially with regard to job preparation and job searches. I'm in the process of applying to different things, and it's not only something that I can list on a resume that, you know, I won essentially what amounts to a pitch competition, um, but it is a great way to figure out how to communicate what you spent the last so many years doing with your life to someone who may not also be in academia, or even if they are someone who is outside your discipline. And like Anna said, um, even if it's not the content piece, but just the fact that you could put together a coherent professional presentation and you have those skills, those are valuable in any business that you go for. So it's something that you not only can just say, hey, I have these skills, but you can actually show people that you have those skills. And so I think that's extremely valuable. It's also helped my family and friends finally understand what I've spent my time doing. So that's a bonus too. Well, and I just want to add to what we've all said is that I think we sound like we're hyping up people that are already good at giving professional presentations when what's been enjoyable for me is helping um, the younger kids come up through our lab and try to convince them to do both our departmental as well as the university-wide 3MT and sit with them and help them become better public communicators. So I would almost motivate people that are less sure of their communication skills to prepare a presentation for the preliminaries because it might not be the best <laughs> of the group, but just sitting down and working on these aspects of presenting will be so beneficial to your career because we've all sat through bad presentations at conferences too. And it's not that the data is bad and it's not that the experimental design was bad, but just the person is bad at giving presentations. So it's something that we don't really teach. Um, and this is an opportunity to get with colleagues and friends and family and take some constructive criticism. Great, thank you so much. So we are almost at time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's um, of time and for joining us today, uh, thank you. But I'm wondering if, there, if each of you could quickly give last parting advice for the potential participants or motivation for the potential participants in the room. And if you're in the room and have a question, feel free to chat that as well. And we can uh, try to get to that. So Carly, parting advice or motivation? Have the first sentence of your talk either piss somebody off or make them really excited. Love it. <laughs> I, want a, I want a guttural emotion after either seeing your slide or the first sentence out of your mouth. Great. Anna? Um, I would say reach out. Like, I don't want to volunteer Carly and Amanda, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure they would also be ready to help. Like, reach out to someone who's done it before, if you know someone a year or two ahead of you. Like, find me on LinkedIn. Like, I love this stuff. I think it's just immensely valuable and continues to be valuable to me, even like almost, well, four years later now. Um, so, find someone who's done it before and talk through with them. Great. Amanda? All right, so I have two things that are gold standard for speech preparation. The first one is the rule of three. Tell people what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. It is a perfect way to make sure that people remember what you're talking about. And the second thing is make sure you answer that so what question. So you know what's important for you and your research because not only does it gonna get you your degree, but it's gonna advance you the field and your discipline in XYZ ways. 
your audience doesn't care about that. They're not in your shoes. They're not in this field. They don't care. So make sure you answer that. So what question for them, no matter what you're doing, how does what you're researching benefit people outside of academia? And so I think if you can get those two aspects in a presentation, it's sure to be gold. Great. Thank you all so much. And thank you to the panelists for taking the time to join us. Uh, for those in the room, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to Morris, Chad, or myself. I encourage you to look at the planning document uh, for more information and links, as well as the Grad Research Live website. The preliminary uh, date, the date to get your preliminary videos in is October 26th. Uh, but again, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Morris and Ashley. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. See you, Carly.